Yes. We had a statement in uh, Promise Keepers back years ago when we were all involved in Promise Keepers. Uh, it said, uh, God is good. And then we said, all the time. And all the time, God is good. And we said that every time. And the reason we could say it is because that is absolutely true. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And you could add to that, God loves me all the time, no matter what, no matter how I've been, it's not a performance thing. One of the, one of the biggest lies that Satan tells us continually is that our relationship with God is all about how we perform. And if we perform well, then we have a great relationship. And if we perform poorly, then God doesn't want us anymore. And he's constantly preaching that to us. But I want to tell you that the Bible says that there's nothing that we can do that'll separate us from the love of God. And there's no height, no depth, no principality, no power, no demon. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God because God loves us all the time. And all the time, God loves us. And one of the most amazing things tools and, and benefits God gives us in our life as Christians is a, a, a wonderful essence, a wonderful uh, emotion, a wonderful uh, tool of peace in our life. And the peace of God is profound. It is it's, it's, it's core to our life. It, it is deep within us. And the peace of God is birthed in us, according to Galatians 5, when Jesus Christ comes into our heart and saves our soul and the Holy Spirit is deposited in us, the Holy Spirit brings with him some fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. And, and so the, the fruit of peace and peace in my life is not something that just uh, is there automatically. It is something that is grown in my life by the power of the Holy Spirit that is on the inside of me. In other words, peace doesn't belong to me. Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit's in my life, then it allows me to have the peace of God. And, and last week we looked at uh, why that would be important in our life because Jesus said in John 14, 30, I think it's 37, it might be 27, uh, my peace, when he was leaving, he said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I to you, but my peace I give to you. So don't be afraid, don't be fearful, because I'm giving you something that from the time I leave until the time I come back, it's available to you, and it will work in your life, and so, you know, relax. And there's nothing that Satan can use to imitate the peace of God. If the peace of God is deposited in my life, it is powerful and it is important. And not, last week we looked at uh, four things, and I'm just to hit it quickly so we can just jump in today. Uh, what we're looking at today, uh, the importance of God's peace. Number one is peace is how God guides us. In other words, God guides us with his peace. Colossians said, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, which means umpire. And umpire means to make situational uh, decisions. So when we have situations in our life where we're wondering which way to go, how, what direction to take, whether this is something God wants us to do, whether we should do this or not do this, he says, here's what you do. Let the peace of God make that decision for you. And what that simply means is I pray and I ask God, God, is this the direction for you? Is this what you would have me to do? And if I don't sense any of the peace of God over that, then I know that's not God's direction. And I tell you, Ta Pastor Tanya and I have made hundreds of decisions this way, where we've asked the Lord for his direction or his leadership or his wisdom about whatever situation it might be. And I'll ask her, well, babe, do you have any peace about this? It seems like we would go this way. And do you have any peace? And if she says no, then we don't go that way. We both have to be in agreement with it. There's no strong arming, no coercing, no bullying. Well, come on, you know, if, you know. I mean, no, no, you, you just pray and you ask God to give you that peace on the inside of you if this is his will. And that's how God guides us. He said, let the, let the peace of God guide you. The second thing that peace does is peace is how God protects our mind and heart against Satan's attack of fear and anxiety. I guess I could put that on the screen for you. I just, 
<laughs> I started to turn around and read it, but it wasn't up there. Peace is how God protects our mind and heart against Satan's attacks of fear and anxiety. Remember, this came from Philippians chapter four, where he said, be anxious for nothing, which tells you that anxiety is a decision that you can make, that, that you can choose to be anxious or choose not to be anxious. So he says, uh, don't be anxious for anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will protect your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. So what is God saying there? He's saying that Satan wants to attack us with anxiety and fear and distress and depression and evil and darkness and heaviness and all of those different negative emotions in life. And God has a way of protecting us. How, what is God's way of protecting us? He said, well, when you pray, look, don't be anxious for something. Yeah. I, I mean, it is your choice. I mean, it, look, he wouldn't tell us not to be anxious if we didn't have a choice. I mean, that would be, that would be torture for God to say, okay, you, you don't be anxious, but I'm not going to give you the ability not to be. No, you, you have the ability not to be. He says, don't be anxious for anything. But when you pray... Uh, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, bring your request to God. And when you do this, God is going to give you something that is going to protect, and that word protect means to guard against a military invasion. So God is going to give us something that is going to protect us against the assault of the enemy. And what is that thing? Uh, and the peace of God which passes all understanding. It, you shouldn't have peace. Others around you don't have peace. Everybody else is upset about this, and given the circumstances, you ought to be upset too, but you're not upset. Why are you not upset? Well, there's a peace of God inside you that goes beyond reasoning and understanding, and God says that what, that's what he uses to protect us from the anxiety and the fear and the terror of the enemy. So the third thing that God's peace is good for or important in our life, peace is the platform of our witness. This just simply means that we have something inside of us that this world is hungry for. And when the world sees what they're hungry for, then uh, they're gonna be attracted to those who have what they're looking for. And what the world wants more than anything else is peace. We have a world full of addicts, and all of these addicts are after something. What are they after? They're after a moment of peace. And when someone is around, well, you know, the, the, in Ephesians, the scripture says, put on the whole armor of God. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you'll be able to withstand against the, the evil one and, and against his methods, his wiles of the devil. And he says, put your you know, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, uh, put on the girdle of truth, uh, and have your feet shod with the preparation of what? Of the gospel of peace. So the Lord's telling us, you know what our gospel is? Our, I've heard somebody in revival meetings, I've heard, you know, of course, I came out of a Baptist background. We had revival meetings all the time. And in revival meeting, boy, people would just be really concerned about people's salvation and, and, and for them to come to the Lord. And they put a lot of pressure when they were preaching and they hold messages about coming to the Lord, turn or burn, get right or get left, change your stroke or go up and smoke, you know, all those kind of things. And just tremendous pressure. And, 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 and they would really emphasize uh, not going to hell and, and burning in hell and all of that kind of stuff. And, and after, the, after the service was over, many people would say, boy, he really preached the gospel tonight. No, he didn't. That's not the gospel. The gospel means the good news. The, the fact that you're going to hell is not good news. That's bad news. And that's not the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong or that you shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that the gospel is the good news that you don't have to go to hell because Jesus died for you on the cross. And so the gospel that we preach is peace, peace between God and man, reconciliation between God and man that brings peace between God and man. That is the gospel that we preach. 
So peace is important in our life because it's the very essence of the message that we are preaching to the world and the world is drawn to. And then the fourth thing is the purpose of our ministry and influence. Uh, the Beatitudes tell us this, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So when you actively make peace, when you influence people toward peace, when that is your ministry to bring peace into situations, that is why God gives us peace. Because we are to take peace wherever we go. We are to make peace wherever we go. Peace, the ultimate peace, is the peace between God and man. That's the ultimate peace. But when we make peace, we reflect our Father, which is in heaven, and we are called the children of God. So peace is a tremendously important thing. It does these four things and maybe even more that you can think of. So how do you get this peace? If, this is, if it's that important and God has how do you get it? Well, I'm going to give you five foundations just real quick. Uh, for having the peace of God. I know many of you already have the peace of God, but let's just look at it real quick. You say, how would I have the peace of God? What is it that needs to be true about my life that'll give me the peace of God and let God work in my life? All right, here's number one. The first foundation, and this is really the most important foundation. Let me see if I can get it going. There it is. This is the most important one, and this is the first one, and it is submission to the Lord, uh, to the Lordship of Christ. So if I'm going to have the peace of God, the first foundation in my life is I have to uh, surrender myself to the Lord. I have to give up. You've heard me say it in the invitation many times, wave the white flag. I have to surrender. I have to say I quit. <laughs> uh, 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 in, in a lot of uh, events nowadays, MMAs and wrestling and all that kind of stuff, you know, they have these submission holes where, you know, they get you in a certain place and then you just got to tap out, you know, and just say, uh, all right, I give up, man, I give up. Well, that's what submission means. It means to quit fighting. It means you give up to the control of another. And I'm just telling you that the first foundation that we must have in order to have the peace of God, because peace doesn't come from within us. Peace is a gift that the Holy Spirit brings with him when he comes into your life. So you're not going to have true peace unless the Holy Spirit brings it with him and grows it in your life. And that comes when you submit yourself to the Lordship of Christ. Let me just show you in Isaiah in Isaiah 9, now this is a Messianic scripture, and Messianic just means this is an Old Testament scripture of thousands of years before Jesus was born, where God through a prophet is telling us what the Messiah, what Jesus is going to be like thousands of years in advance. And notice what the Bible says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Notice verse seven. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. In other words, Isaiah is saying when this Messiah comes, he's going to have a government. Everybody say the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the government of Christ. And so when Jesus comes, he brings with him a kingdom of which he is the king. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. And when his kingdom gets established on this earth, there will be no end to his kingdom and his kingdom will be a kingdom of peace. And so the first thing that must happen in any of our lives is we have to surrender to the kingdom that is coming, that is the government of Christ in order for our citizenship to change and for peace to come into our life. And notice what James says. James chapter four, James has a lot about this, but this is just one verse. He says, therefore, all right, therefore submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I've heard many times people that were having all kinds of difficulties in their life evil things, terrible things, bad things. And someone would just simply come up to them and say, I tell you what you need to do. You need to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And the verse does say that. Resist him and he'll flee from you. But before you can resist, you have to do what? You have to submit. 
And the reason why is because if you don't submit to God, you are going to find yourself fighting God. Not only the devil, but, the, but God. And let me tell you, that's not a good fight. The Apostle Paul, that's right, right, the Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. What is the good fight? The good fight is with the devil. We can win that fight. The bad fight is with God. And in verse six, the verse right before this says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In other words, you're gonna find yourself in a battle against God if you don't submit yourself first to God. Because whenever you don't submit yourself to God, there are two strong wills that, that, are, that are going at it and, and, and God's gonna fight against you and you're not gonna win that battle. But when you're submitted to God, your will becomes submitted to Jesus Christ and peace takes over your life. And how do you know if you're submitted? Well, how much do you pray? The amount of prayer in my life tells me how submitted I am to the kingdom of God. Because if I don't ask God what to do, and if I don't ask God what, where to go, and I don't ask God about it, then I'm basically just a free agent, freewheeling around here, making decisions all about myself. When I'm submitted to him, I ask him, I talk to him, I pray. And the more I talk to him, the more he shares in my life, the more his government increases in my life, and the more peace I have in my life. So in order for peace to be real in my life, I have to submit myself to the Lordship of Christ and any area in my life that I don't have peace in tells me an area of my life that I've not submitted to Christ. When you don't have peace in certain areas of your life, it shows you something, that that particular area of your life has not been submitted to Christ. It might be your marriage, it might be your finances, it might be your children, you know, it might be your business, it might be decisions you need to make in life. You've surrendered others, but you've never surrendered that, and you don't have peace in that. So the first foundation is, I've gotta submit myself to Christ. Here's the second foundation. Second foundation is a diligent faith-filled prayer life. The foundation of a diligent faith-filled Prayer life brings the peace of God in my life. Now, let's go back to Philippians chapter four. I quoted it for you, but here it is on the screen. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, notice that it says, don't be anxious for anything, which just tells us we have a choice. But notice what else it says. That we, that we be anxious for nothing and we go to God in prayer and supplication and what do we do? When we, when, we, when we bow down to pray and we ask God to supply our need, which is supplication, which is that's what I mean, God, we need your supply. All right, what's the first thing we do? What's the next line? With thanksgiving. Go to him, don't be anxious in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving lest your request be made known to God. Prayer without thanksgiving is just simply griping in the spirit, right? It's a shopping list. I go to God, give me, give me, give me, give me in Jesus' name, right? I mean, there, have you ever had a time in your life where you prayed about something and you were just as torn up at the end when you finished praying as you were when you started praying? I mean, you know what you, you probably were doing? You probably were just trying to bother God. I mean, you were bothered, right? You were all upset and torn up, and you just wanted God to be all upset and torn up, and you were just trying to worry God about something because, you know, you were worried about it, so God, and since I'm worried about it, let me just worry you about it. But God says, look, when you come to me, here's what, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to transfer the burden to me. Now, if you don't transfer the burden, you're not gonna have any peace. Now, what I mean by transfer the burden? Well, here's what Peter has to say about it in 1 Peter 5. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him for he cares for you. What does Peter say that we are to do when we go to the Lord in prayer. We go to God and we pray, 
and we cast all of our care on him because he says, I, can, I care for you and I can carry the load. So when you go to the Lord in prayer, don't be anxious, you know, just that. that and, and I know, uh, all right, some of you out there, you might say, well, how, what, what, how do I pray? I mean, what are you talking about praying? Well, let me just give you a little quick lesson on praying, all right, very quickly. When you get up in the morning, get you a sheet of paper and write down a list of everything that you're concerned about. Uh, God, uh, my children, uh, 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 the, my job today, I have a big meeting, uh, whatever it is, just write it on a list. And then when you get through writing the list down, write prayer list at the top. And that's, your, that's how you pray. Just go before the Lord and bring all the things that you are concerned about and that trouble you because he said, cast all of your cares, the things that you care about, I tell you what, you know, you know what you need to be praying about? Whatever your mind wanders to while you're trying to pray. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but I'll be sitting there trying to sound all spiritual to God and, you know, presenting my case and so forth, and my mind will be wandering about uh, to something about, man, that's a terrible thing. And what, what, what it is, my, I ought to be praying about what my mind wanders to. That, that's really what it boils down to. And just lay these before the Lord. And, and, and the Bible says, all right, when you pray, uh, come before in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and let your request be made known to God. And, and, and God's going to answer those prayers and he's going to give you peace and God's going to work in your life. And so, and so we, we, we just bring those things and we bring them before the Lord. And according to, according to Peter, he said, when you pray, you just cast all of your cares on him and, and, and you pray with thanksgiving and let him take control. Now, let me just show you what that means. Bow your head with me just one second, all right? We're gonna pray. Let me just show you exactly what we would do if we were gonna pray with thanksgiving. We're gonna cast all of our care on him. It would be something like this, all right? This would be, just let it, let it sink into your heart. All right, Father, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you hear my prayers. I'm not coming to you because I because I don't think you know what's going on. I know that you know everything and you know what's going on. You know every hair of my head, every detail of my life. And I'm thankful that I have a loving father that takes care of me and loves me. And I'm coming to you to transfer the burden of this. I'm just a sheep. I can't bear burdens. It stresses me out. I'm giving this to you, Father. I'm trusting you with my relationship, my friends, my education, my children, my whatever, whatever it might be. And Lord, I'm now at loading the burden onto you because you told me to cast all my cares on you. So Father, take this burden and I'm trusting you to work it in today in Jesus' name, amen. And Peter says, when you cast all of your burden on him, that that brings peace into your life and a peace that passes all understanding is going to guard you and protect you from an enemy that's constantly trying to assault you and create fear and anxiety in you. The old folks used to call this praying through. You ever heard that line before? You need to pray through. Well, what is praying through? Praying through means I pray until I have the peace of God. That's what it really means. When do I know when I need to stop praying? When I have peace. Yeah, when I have peace, then I know I'm through. Now, it might take several sessions for you to have peace. It may not happen all at one time, but just keep lay, lay it before him and, 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 and say, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for your peace. I'm, I'm watching for your peace. And when you have peace, then you, you can go and don't worry and be anxious while you pray because God leads you that way. All right, here's number three. Yeah, that's the problem. We cast it on and then we pick it back up and carry it away with us. And that's the problem that most of us have in prayer. Uh, it's not that we don't lay it before him. We just pick it up when we get ready to leave. But he said, no, 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 no. Leave it with me because I care for you. All right, number three, the third, the third foundation for the peace of God is a Godward mindset. Now, I know many of you that took notes several weeks ago on the message I preached on discouragement. You said, well, this was one of the points that you had in discouragement. You know, I had three keys for how to fight discouragement. Number one was a Godward mindset. Well, what does a Godward mindset mean? It means I have my mind on God. So having my mind on God is going to be the essence of many of the great tools that God gives us in life. And it's gonna fit in almost anything that has to do 
with making myself more available to God and God using me in greater ways and protecting me and giving me peace. But a Godward mindset, let me just show you what I'm talking about from this passage. We didn't look at this one the other day, but look at this one. This is Isaiah 26. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Your mindset is yours to set. I know you're aware of this. Nobody else can set your mind for you but you. And God says, set your mind on me, and if you do, I'm going to keep you in peace because I know that you trust in me, you set your mind on me. And so what we do when we wake up in the morning and we begin to go to the Lord in prayer, we just say, Lord, I want my mind to be set on you today because I don't know what I'm going to face today, but whatever it is, Lord, having my mind and my heart set on you is going to bring me peace in life. So I'm setting my mind on you. Now, I know many of you have had terrible things happen in your life, and I know that I'm not... I'm, I'm not exclusive in this kind of thing. I, I'm 64 years old, right at it, and I've had lots of terrible things happen in my life. There, at times, there seems like there are days where almost like the devil saves up stuff to just pour out on your life. Have you had days like that? It just seemed like one thing after another. You didn't even get past one thing before something else came in. And on those particular kind of days, boy, it really gets tough. I've, I've come in from uh, being in some particularly rough days, and of course, I'm coming home, and I'm coming home to Tanya, and I, and I don't want her to be upset and anxious about some stuff, and so I'm trying to uh, keep my face from moving. You know, I'm trying to come in and be all calm and, 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 and smooth about things and not reflect that anything's going on in my life. And the first question she asks when she opens the door or when she sees me, she says, what's wrong? There's just something about it, isn't it? There's just an essence about it. You just know something's wrong, right? Well, what this verse is saying is, look, on those kind of days, when you, when you have terrible things that are going on in life and everything seems to be crashing in on you, it's vital that you have your mind set on God. Let me tell you what the Lord's told me in times like that. He said basically to me, and now this, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was a voice inside my, my heart and my head that said basically, you know, what, you know what fear is? Fear is expecting the devil to move. When I come in and my mind is set on, 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 on fear, the reason it's set on fear is because I'm expecting the devil to move. And when I'm expecting the devil to move, there's not going to be any peace in my life. Right. Faith is expecting God to move. And when my mind is set on, on, on God moving and set on God, then I can have peace in my life. Let me show you what uh, this passage in Roman 8, Romans 8 says. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded, every, that's... that's uh, earthly minded, that means uh, your lost side of your life, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So God says, look, set your mind on me and expect me to move, and then you can have peace in life because we do set what we focus on. You remember when David, King David, little boy David, before he actually became king, went down in to fight Goliath? And you know the story, he's standing up and Goliath is shouting and insulting Israel and all that kind of stuff. And, and David looks down in the valley and David looks at Goliath and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would insult the people of God? And then as he goes down into the valley, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but he calls Goliath an uncircumcised Philistine several times. It's almost like he's just kind of focused on that, you know? Who is this uncertain? You come to me with sword and spear, I come to you in the name of the Lord. I mean, in other words, David uses that phrase, uncircumcised Philistine, several times. What's the, what's the deal with this? Well, you know that God made a covenant with Israel, right? And that covenant he made with Abraham, and that covenant was sealed with the sign of circumcision. Now, what did that covenant say? That covenant said, God said, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to fight for you. Those that are for you, I'm going to bless them. Those that are against you, I'm going to curse them. 
You're going to be great. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to have a kingdom that is as big as the sands of the sea, stars and skies, and the Messiah's going to come from you, and all earth's going to be blessed with you. So it's a great covenant of protection and promise and all of that. Well, it was circumcision that was the sign that that covenant was sealed with. So what David was saying was, you know where my mind is? My mind is on God. I have set my mind on God. Now, all of the other soldiers that were standing on the side looking down at Goliath, not one of them looked at the giant the same way. They all looked at the giant. They saw a nine-foot-tall giant. Mm -hmm. Big man to be scared of. David looked down at him, and David saw an uncircumcised Philistine, which just simply means, look, my mind is on God. Here's what I'm saying. Look, I look at him. Uh, I'm circumcised. He's not. Right? That means I'm protected, and he's not. That means I can go down here. I don't, Saul, I don't, need, I don't need your armor. I can fight him with a slingshot and kill him because I, I'm circumcised, and he's not because my mind is, what can God do in this situation? So I'm just telling you that your mindset is everything. And what you have your mind set on is important when you're, when, when you're fighting an enemy that is trying to take your peace and rob your spirit and create depression and fear and anxiety and all of those things. Let me give you this other, other two real quick. Daily dependence upon the Holy Spirit is another foundation. By daily dependence on the Holy Spirit, I, I'm just saying to you, and then put it in a nutshell, uh, I'm just saying that we have to recognize every day that it is, the, it is the Holy Spirit of God that carries us through life. Now, I, I know that you know, we feel adequate to face all kinds of issues and so forth in life, but I'm just telling you in Galatians chapter 5, and I've quoted it so many times, how many of you have memorized Galatians 5, 22 and 23? Yeah, many of you have. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to quote it, so don't be afraid. I just wondered. <laughs> Somebody's going, you know, like, oh, please don't ask me to quote it. But, but, but it just says, uh, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control, which just simply says that all of those emotions and all of those values in our life belong to the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit that brings all of those emotions and all of those values and all those character traits into our life, that we're not born with these, that we don't have these naturally, that these have to be deposited in us by the Holy Spirit. And so dependence daily on the Holy Spirit just simply means, look, these are all free gifts. God gives you these things free because of his grace. When Jesus comes into your heart, the Holy Spirit brings these things and they're free of charge and you don't have to pay for them and work for them and all of those kind of things. They're all free, but God wants us to acknowledge at least that we need these things in life. And to say, God, the, right, these belong to you and bring these into my life. And when I pray, that I at least acknowledge the fact that, God, I need the Holy Spirit working in my life and I need the Holy Spirit to bring me peace today. I'm having a terrible meeting with some very tough people to deal with and I need your peace. So, God, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to bring peace into my life or this is a terrible day. This is a day that's been sad and maybe somebody passed away years ago and is sad all the time and you say, God, this is a terrible day for me and I was hard on my emotions. So, Lord, I need your joy today. Holy Spirit, release the joy into my life today. And that's daily dependence on the Holy Spirit and recognizing the fact that all of these wonderful fruit and all these emotions, you know, our emotions are like an engine. You know, an engine, an engine runs on oil, right? All right, let's say we run out of oil. What happens to the engine? Well, friction happens, right? It gets so hot, boom, burns up, seals up, quits running. All right, our emotions are just like that. Our emotions are like that engine, and the oil that our emotions are designed to run on is the Holy Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit invades our life every day, our emotions are properly lubricated so that our emotions don't lock up on us and shut down in life. So that's dependence on the Holy Spirit. Let me give you the last one. All right, number five, praise and worship. The foundation of praise and worship in my life are vital for the 
peace of God to be expressed in my life. Let me just give you this one verse. Uh, there are three or four verses, but it's out of this one passage, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, notice what he says. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. All right, this is what God says he's giving to us. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give to you when, you when 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 you are mourning, when you're shook up, when, you're, when, when there's no peace in your life, let me tell you what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you beauty for those things that look like they've been destroyed in life. Beauty for those ashes of your life. I'm going to replace those terrible things in your life with beautiful things. And I'm going to give you the oil of joy for the mourning that you're doing in life. And then notice and I'm going to give you the garment of praise for that spirit of heaviness. When the devil brings that spirit of heaviness to you, and that spirit of heaviness can be darkness, depression, anxiety, fear, guilt, whatever that heaviness is that the devil throws on your life, and he will throw it on your life. At your weakest moment, when you are down, when you are fighting, he will throw that spirit of darkness and heaviness at you. And notice what Jesus said, I'm giving you. I'm giving you the garment of praise for that spirit of heaviness. Why is it a garment? Well, it's a garment because you have to put it on. In other words, you're not born with it. You don't wake up every day with it. To have it, you have to put it on. It's a garment. It's a choice that you make. And Colossians tells us that we have to put on the spirit of humility. Why do we have to put on the spirit of humility? Because as human beings, we are just naturally prideful. So there are two things every day that I must put on, that I must make a choice about every day in order for the peace of God to rule in my life. One is I've got to humble myself. I have to practice humility every day. I have to choose to be humble. That's an attitude that I make a choice over. And I must choose to be humble. And secondly, I look for an opportunity every day to put on the spirit of humility. That's what I'm talking about. See, I can't find anything. I told you all that before. <laughs> that wasn't there. You made that. I know you did. All right, where was I? Every day, we make two choices. We choose to praise God every day. When we see something that God does, praise Him. When, I mean, don't just let it fly by and say, well, yeah. no, no, no. Put on the garment of praise. And that spirit of heaviness, you know, you, know, you know, anxiety just wears us out, doesn't it? I mean, when you're anxious about something, it just wears you out. And the reason it wears you, it just churns inside you and churns inside you. And it just wears your emotions out. And after a while of churning and churning and you're worn out, and then a spirit of depression kind of begins to come into your life. 
And when that spirit of depression starts coming into your life, guess what the devil does? He throws that blanket of darkness on you so all you can see is yourself. And, 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 and that sends you downhill into fear and anxiety and stress and burdens and depression and all of those other negative things in life. Jesus said, what I'm, what I'm saying to you, if that peace will change that in your life. And when you have an opportunity to praise me, it is praise that you choose to put on that's going to make me real in your life. Remember, you have an option to choose what you think on every day. Nobody's going to choose it for you. You choose what you're going to think on every day. All right, so bow your head with me one moment.